This is the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast. Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast. I'm Dr. Lynn Marie Morsky, your guide on this journey. And today we're going to be exploring endogenous DMT with Dr. Rick Strassman. Dr. Strassman is an adjunct professor of psychiatry at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque and the author of DMT, The Spirit Molecule, and The Psychedelic Handbook. His DMT and psilocybin studies in the early 1990s initiated the renewal of human research with psychedelics in the U.S. Now, before we get to Dr. Strassman, just a reminder that the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast is for educational and informational purposes only. Nothing here is to be construed as medical or legal advice. And one last reminder, if you are a clinician, doctor, nurse, nurse practitioner, PA, et cetera, therapist, clinical social worker, and you'd like to to learn more about psychedelics, please visit the Psychedelic Medicine Association at our website, psychedelicmedicineassociation.org, and join us. It is our mission to educate clinicians of all types across the world about psychedelics so that when you have a patient who comes in and a psychedelic therapy might be appropriate for them, you feel comfortable discussing it and referring or prescribing when legal and appropriate. Again, the website is psychedelicmedicineassociation.org. Now, without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Strassman. Uh, Thank you, Lynn. It was, uh, you know, worth an hour of, you know, fiddling with uh, our connection. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I would say it it probably does take the cake for the longest that technology has ever sabotaged an interview. So I really appreciate your patience. I'm very glad that we're making this happen still. So, and I'm just thrilled for you to be here. By the way, thank you so much for sending me a copy of the Psychedelic Handbook. Uh, It is like my prized possession to have a signed copy of that on my little nightstand. So I really appreciate you sending that over. And I'm very excited because we have done over 140 episodes of the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast and zero have been on endogenous DMT. I have been waiting to have this discussion for a very long time. So oh, great. Yes. Yeah, so if we could get into by starting with you telling us a little bit about some of the original hypotheses surrounding endogenous psychedelics and um, some of what was thought about their connection to things like schizophrenia. Uh, sure. Um, well, I started on this uh, on this path, um, or I started, you know, thinking about this path as an undergraduate uh, in college. I was uh, in California, you know, uh, Northern California, in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and uh, you know, there was an influx of two reliable new mind-altering techniques into culture at that time: the, you know, the psychedelics and Eastern meditation. And uh, descriptions of the two sets of experiences overlapped to you know, some extent, you know, visions and voices and um, out-of-body states and extreme emotions and new insights and things like that. So I thought there must be some common biological denominator that was activated by both you know, psychedelic you know, drugs and certain you know, types of meditation. Uh, so I thought there might be, for example, some part of the brain or some you know, substance released in the brain uh, in response to meditation or in response to taking LSD. So, you know, that was you know more or less you know the reason I went to medical school and became a psychiatrist. Uh, and uh, I began you know looking at the pineal gland. Even in college, I was interested in the pineal. Uh, you know, Jim Fadiman at Stanford at the time introduced me to the pineal you know, because of my interest in looking for a naturally occurring substance or part of the brain which stimulated experiences that might be called spiritual. Um, and he, you know, directed me to the pineal. You know, so my first independent clinical research study was looking at melatonin uh, because, you know, back in the early 80s, there was not a lot of information about the human psychopharmacology of melatonin. You know, there was some you know, data suggesting it was, you know, psychedelic or stimulated dreams, or it made depression worse, or it made depression, you know, psychotic, you know, so it was still, you know, at that time, it was still kind of a black box. You know, so we performed an exhaustive study of the psychopharmacology of melatonin, um, and uh, we determined it was only sedating. Uh, And by that time, I learned about, uh, you know, DMT, you know, which is also naturally occurring in, you know, the mammalian body. Um, and it has a long you know, track record of you know, being known to be extremely psychedelic. 
Uh, so I changed, uh, you know, directions, uh, spent, you know, two years applying for permission, you know, funding to start the DMT work, uh, worked on the you know, paper. Well, I you know, submitted the original paperwork in September 88, and we gave our first you know, dose of DMT in November 1990. You, my theory, well, you know, the study itself had explicit and implicit goals. The explicit goal you know, was to determine, you know, dose response effects of graded, you know, doses of DMT in a group of normal volunteers, um, you know, so characterize the biological effects and the you know, psychological um, effects as exhaustively um, as possible. You know, so to that end, we measured a slew of biological parameters, you know, neuroendocrine primarily, but autonomic and cardiovascular as well. Um, and we also developed a new questionnaire uh, which was uh, intended to quantify the DMT experience. You know, was it visual? Was it emotional? Was it somatic? Those kinds of things. Um, you know, so the implicit um, goal of the study you, you was to compare uh, the effects of DMT with naturally occurring highly altered states. Uh, you know, back in the day when they first discovered, you know, DMT in human body fluids in the you know, 60s, early 70s, you know, the emphasis, you know, was on, you know, correlating, uh, you know, levels of DMT or activity of DMT with psychosis, especially schizophrenia, you know, because, you know, DMT, you know, created an altered state, schizophrenia is an altered state, and, you know, there's a certain degree of overlap, you know, so, you know, there's a lot of interest in comparing blood levels. Uh, between schizophrenics and normals, uh, responses to DMT and schizophrenics and normals, even developing a you know, vaccine perhaps to block you know, the activity um, of DMT to, you know, to see if it had some antipsychotic effects. You know, so those uh, were the kinds of studies you know, looking at a potential you know, role of you know, DMT in you know, naturally occurring altered states. Nobody was especially interested in you know, more desirable altered states, you know, like meditation effects, spiritual experience, you know, dreams, um, even, uh, you know, near-death states. Uh, so I, uh, you know, so I decided, you know, to take that approach, you know, to look at, you know, the less you know, pathological experiences, which might, well, you know, which, which occur naturally and, you know, could potentially you know, be mediated by endogenous DMT. You know, so if giving DMT uh, to normal volunteers, completely independent of any coaching or guidance or uh, education or uh, expectation development, if just you know giving DMT, uh, you produced effects, you know, like a near death state, uh, you know, then you could say, well, maybe naturally occurring DMT is playing a role in the near death state. Or if you know DMT you know, caused experiences like dreams, um, and everybody you know, dreams, so the volunteers you know, could say, yeah, this is like a dream, or it's not like a dream. You know, to the extent, um, you know, to the extent you know that it was like a dream, you could say, you know, uh, perhaps naturally occurring you know, DMT is you know, playing a role in you know, the dream state, and you know, likewise for spiritual experiences, um, if. Um, you give your DMT and it replicates, you know, certain aspect of spiritual experiences. You could, uh, you know, theorize that naturally I'm occurring DMT plays a role as well. You know, so this, you know, kind of, you know, ties into the label that sometimes people give psychedelics as entheogens, uh, you know, that they contain inherently, intrinsically spiritual effects. Uh, you know, but I think, you know, that's a, you know, that's an effect of, you know, the set and, uh, uh, you know, the setting in which, uh, you know, th these compounds are given. If you teach people about spiritual experiences, uh, if, if you coach them to have spiritual experiences, um, if, you know, the expectation of the study is to have spiritual experiences, if when you're in the state itself, you're guided to have certain kinds of experiences and, you know, and, uh, you know, to not have others, you know, then you'll have a spiritual experience, you know, which is you know, what we discovered. Um, I think the best term for these compounds is, you know, psychedelic, which means mind manifesting or mind, um, you know, disclosing, you know, because only one of our you know, 55 or so you know, normal volunteers had what one might call 
uh, like a mystical unitive state, you know, the white light, no content, no words, out of body, uh, you know, time stop, those kinds of things. And, you know, this was a person who was a religious studies major in college, was always interested in this kind of experience, and he had one. On the other hand, there was a, a volunteer in the study um, who was a nurse, very interested in the near-death state. She studied NDE, she looked at them, she went to lectures, you know, she went to workshops, you know, trying to, uh, uh, you know, to induce one. And, you know, she wanted an NDE. Uh, and lo and behold, she had an NDE. Uh, you know, one of our you know, volunteers was a uh, you know, software developer. And, you know, he, uh, you know, saw, you know, uh, you know ones and zeros. Um, an urban shaman, you, you found himself you know, dismembered on a mountaintop and then reconstituted. Uh, and, you know, he came out of it and said, I was hoping to have this experience on my deathbed, but I didn't expect I would have it in a hospital. You know, so everybody, you know, basically had an experience that was totally dependent on them. It was not inherent in the drug. You know, the drug was a nonspecific amplifier of what was already there, more or less conscious. You know, so, you know, what I you know, discovered, you know, in the work is that, you know, DMT was not entheogenic. Uh, it was not inherently spiritual. It just, you know, worked on what the volunteer, you know, brought, you know, to the experience itself. So, uh, you know, that was, you know, kind of the end of the story. In a lot of ways, I had been, you know, banking on a certain kind of spiritual experience. My volunteers were too. Uh, but, um, you know, it just didn't, it just didn't quite work out that way. Did volunteers who came with fear have a really fearful experience? Um, you know, yes and no. Uh, it depended too if you know they were you know conscious of their fear. Uh, if you know they weren't conscious of their fear, but they were afraid, they had scary experiences because they were in denial of their fear. You know, the ones you know who were you know conscious of their fear, you know, they had scary experiences too. Um, you know, there was one gal who um, you know took you know forever you know for us to get started. You know, she said, "I'm not sure I want to do this. I'm not sure I want to do this." Uh, and I said, it's up to you. You know, nobody has a gun to your head. You know, you can stop anytime you want, you, you know, so she grit her teeth and said, okay, go ahead. And as you know, the drug was going in and you're know, taking effect, she just, you know, she started kicking and screaming and saying, no, no, no. You know, so those kinds of people had, had scary experiences. You know, there was one guy, um, who, was, you know, like, you know, Mr. Mellow, you know, tie-dye shirt and frizzy hair and worked at a health food store. Uh, and his, you know, main experiences were with MDMA. And, you know, so he was all kind of love and light, you know, but, uh, you know, his experience, you know, the drug went in and he found himself pinned to the bed, being anally raped by crocodiles oh. and he couldn't oh move. God. It was the scariest experience of his life. He, 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 wow. You know, you know, so that was obviously a, a frightening experience in, you know, somebody who entered the state in a very, you know, very you know, relaxed and hopeful kind of mood. So, um, you know, that's what I, I mean about the drug, you know, works on things which are more or less conscious, you, you know, so uh, it is you know, predicated on, uh, you know, the notion uh, of, you know, the existence of things which exist in our mind, but we aren't aware of them. Uh, you know, Freud's unconscious, for example, or the pre-conscious, you know, where you're, you know, barely I'm aware of, of you know, certain, th uh, you know, thoughts or you know, feelings, but, you know, they're not, you know, really something, you know, that are in the front of your mind. So, yeah, uh, you know, there were exp uh, scary experiences. You know, some people were were afraid to get started, but you know, depending on you know, how they handle the first maybe, you know, 30 seconds, um, if you resist the first, you know, 30 seconds of the DMT rush, uh, it can be pretty stressful, you know, but even if you go into it a bit uh, tense, but you relax into the, I'm um, into the rush, uh, you know, then, you know, things can turn out pretty well. Interesting. And since you brought up near-death experiences, I would love to ask you some of the questions regarding things that I think kind of urban legend we've heard about endogenous DNT, 
DMT and what research that you have done has shown. And one of those is that, that there's this concept that endogenous DMT is released when we are near death. And can you talk a little bit about the research that you've done into that? Yeah. Um, well, you know, one of the things that you know, brought me to the pineal gland actually, you know, was the, the, you know, the possibility of the pineal gland you know, producing DMT. Uh, especially at the time of death, uh, you know, the DMT is, or, you know, the pineal gland is very hard to stimulate. It's very hard to stimulate. The only way to, you know, really, you know, kind of, you know, push it, uh, you know, push it off of its, uh, you know, stable point, you know, during the day anyway, is uh, to just really stress out animals or, you know, to give them a huge, you know, dose of adrenaline, uh, for example. And, you know, then you could like just, you know, budge the production of melatonin. Uh, and I thought, you know, well, perhaps, you know, the DM, you know, the, you know, perhaps the pineal gland is so well protected in order to you know, prevent it from uh, inadvertently or, you know, because of the, sl the, sl the, uh, slightest, you know, perturbation in, you know, physiology, you know, producing DMT as well, uh, you know, when it wouldn't be worth, or, you know, where it wouldn't be welcome. Um, you know, so one of my, you know, pineal, uh, you know, theories is there's no more stressful, you know, time than when you're dying. And, you know, that kind of uh, could, um, it, it could indirectly, you know, support, you know, the notion of, you know, pineal you know, production of DMT, you know, which only occurs, you know, during the stress of a near-death state. Um, you know, so we, well, in collaboration with a group in Ann Arbor, you know, uh, you know, Jimo Borgijan and John Dean, this was a paper that came out in 2013, uh, you know, demonstrating production of DMT in living rodent pineal gland. Uh, and it was only just, you know, resting, you know, resting levels. They, you know, put a probe in, you know, to the living rodent pineal, you got some tissue, you pulled it out and they found DMT. You know, so that, you know, supported the notion of pineal production of DMT. You know, but a study six, you know, six years later, actually, you know, same group, GMO and John, you know, they demonstrated instead quite high concentrations of DMT in the brain. Uh, and, you know, not significant amounts in pineal. And they went back, you know, to, re you know, to, re in, uh, you know, to reinterpret the original you know, pineal uh, paper and concluded that you know, probably what happened was that the probe snagged you know, brain tissue on the way in and out of the pineal gland. And what they were looking at was you know, brain DMT. You know, so they looked a lot more carefully in the 2019 study. And they found concentrations of DMT to be quite high, you know, comparable to serotonin and dopamine. Uh, and what was especially interesting was that concentrations in the visual cortex increased dramatically in the dying rodent brain. You know, so that's quite strong support for a potential role of endogenous uh, you know, DMT elevation, um, at least in you know, the visual you know, phenomena that occurs in an NDE. That's so interesting. And I know that you've done these studies and in conjunction with the group in Ann Arbor, figuring out that maybe it's not in the pineal, it's in the brain, but do we yet know where it is synthesized versus where it exists? Yeah, yeah, the cortex, uh, the visual cortex. Um, you know, once upon a time, you know, people believe that the lung produced you know, DMT. And, you know, they believe that because if you ground up you know, rabbit, especially, uh, uh, you know, lung tissue, and you added the ingredients, out came DMT. Uh, you know, but the issue with those studies was that it mixed up, you know, different kinds of rabbit, uh, you know, lung cells. Um, and you need, you know, two specific enzymes for the production of DMT. Um, and, the, you know, they occur in the lung, but they occur um, in different cells. Um, the important thing is to find a you know, uh, you know co-localization of those requisite enzymes, and you know co-localization of those requisite enzymes occur in you know cortical neurons. Uh, you know so that was you know the clincher that you know cortical neurons you know, had the capacity to make DMT, and um, indeed they do. 
Interesting. And I, I also saw in one of your studies that because we might think, okay, DMT is just present in the brain, but you also found it in, I mean, so obviously cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid that goes along the spinal column, but it's also present in blood and urine in a number of individuals, but not all. Um, do you have a thought as to why it was present in some and not others? Yeah. Well, those you know, studies, you're looking at levels of DMT in blood, urine, spinal fluid. You know, those I think were, you know, marred you know, by, you know, lack of specific or sensitive enough, you know, technology. So, you know, concentrations of DMT in blood are extraordinarily low, like, you know, billionths of a, you know, gram per milliliter. You know, so I just don't think we can measure, you know, DMT peripherally outside of the brain with much accuracy. I think the most more important thing is, you know, to look at, you know, the synthesis of DMT in the brain. You know, John Dean, who, uh, you know, got his, you know, doctorate from, uh, you know, Jimo you know, Borjik in, in Ann Arbor, is in uh, UC San Diego now. And, you know, he's working on his holy grail, you know, which is to, you know, to image, you know, DMT synthesis in the living human brain, you know, with fMRI. And, you know, so he just got a grant to start, you know, doing that. Well, well it was a gift. It was a private donation, you know, to start looking at that. You know, but, you know, speaking of endogenous DMT, there's two groups in the world looking at endogenous DMT, which is completely nuts. You you have got this incredibly you know, powerful psychedelic that's, you know, made in the brain in levels as high as serotonin. And there's only two people in the world looking at it. Uh, you know, so... You know, that's, you know, one of my you know, soapboxes is that, you know, somebody or a, a lot of people ought to be, you know, looking at this, like, you know, what is the role of endogenous, uh, you know, DMT? Is it a neurotransmitter? Is there a DMT neurotransmitter system? In in which case, you know, there would be um, a lot of interesting questions we could ask. Yeah, because that, that harkens to me back to when the endocannabinoid system was discovered so much later than, you know, several other systems so much later that it didn't make it into any of my med school textbooks. And I'm supposing not your med school textbooks either, that perhaps there's this entire system, because as your book had pointed out, and you just mentioned that um, we might think, oh, there's not much DMT in the brain because we have never been discussing it in medicine. But you said it's in, it's present in the same levels as something like serotonin or dopamine or, or adrenaline, correct? Yeah, like, you know, like, you know, serotonin and like dopamine. Right, right. Yeah, and you know those are canonical neurotransmitters. Uh, yeah, uh, everybody you know knows that you know, serotonin is a neurotransmitter responsible for mood and impulse, and you know dopamine for pleasure and reward. Yeah, you know, but we you know don't really know what the role of endogenous you know, DMT is. You know, there's still um, a, a couple pieces in the puzzle to you know fully allow DMT to be qualified as a neurotransmitter itself. You know, but even if it's not a neurotransmitter, it still is in the brain, visual cortex, and high concentrations, you know, so uh, I think the search ought to be on for what it's doing there. Yeah, absolutely. And and something I wanted to discuss with you is another, I guess, urban legend is that when you do something like breath work or, or maybe one of these intense meditative states, that that's when the body releases endogenous DNT, uh, DMT. And so I wish, uh, I would love if you could discuss some of your speculations on the potential role that endogenous DMT may play in states like this. Right. Um, well, yeah, you know, so concentrations are just, you know, too low to measure in blood, you know, so if you do breath work or you meditate uh, or you're having an NDE, I um, even, or you have an, you know, like an alien abduction experience, which um, actually, uh, you know, demonstrates um, a lot of, you know, similarities with a high dose of exogenous DMT. Um, you just you know, cannot measure you know, blood levels very accurately. You might be able to measure spinal fluid levels, but um, you're not going to find you know, many volunteers for that. Um, you know, but you know, be that as it may, you could still speculate that you know, to the extent that non-drug states resemble those brought on by giving DMT, the naturally occurring DMT you know, plays a role in the production of those states. You know, but the data um, aren't there yet. You know, that's why we need more people doing this research. Yeah, absolutely. And what um, what do you think about the role that endogenous DMT may play in something like the placebo response? Right. Well, y you know, there is the placebo response, which is a biological response. There's an Im Im immunological 
components. There's inflammatory components. There's you know neuroendocrine components, uh, endorphins, all that. You know, so the you know, placebo response is a real biological response. You know, so um, it's at this strange uh, you know uh, you know juncture be you know between you know the conscious you know the, you know the conscious mind which is being you know told you're getting an active drug but you know but you're not uh and the recruitment of innate you know, healing mechanisms uh in the mind brain complex you know so the placebo response i think is is key to working out the explanatory gap you know which is the uh you know difficulty you know really pinpointing the relationship between you know, biology and subjective experience in the brain. Uh, and I think the placebo response, you know, may yield a lot of you know, valuable information in that regard. And I say that uh, with respect, you know, uh, you know, to psychedelics, because, you know, psychedelics, if you if you keep current on the literature are super placebos, they're panaceas, they do everything. Uh, every month there's a new paper saying eating disorders, you know, sociopathy, progressive political beliefs, um, depression, anxiety, tobacco, alcohol dependence, uh, you know, domestic conviviality, nature appreciation, just goes on and on and on and on. You know, so that's a panacea. And you know, how do panaceas work? Well, through you know, I, I, you know, through placebo. Uh, you know, so uh, if you have, you know, like if you know, so I think what's important when we're doing studies, you know, giving psychedelics, uh, is to start, you know, thinking about their, uh, you know, their broad spectrum effect as a reflection of their being super placebos. They enhance the placebo response. You, you steer people in a particular direction with preparation, expectation, increase their suggestibility, uh, and they will have what you're hoping they will have and they're hoping they will have. You know, so, you know, Charles Manson, for example, you know, he had a group of people, he gave them LSD, and he, uh, uh, you know, cemented you know, certain um, ideas which were already floating around in their minds, which he encouraged them to think about more, act out more, things like that. So you can turn the placebo enhancing effects of psychedelics into any direction. You know, but you know, be that as it may, um, if, if you know, psychedelics are you know, super placebos and we have a you know, psychedelic you know, drug in our brain, uh, it's you know, tempting to speculate that you know, normally the placebo effect, you know, could be mediated by endogenous DMT. Yeah, that makes sense. And and I'm wondering if there is a role that that plays along with what I think we're seeing in, at least in in vitro, and, and maybe you could tell me more about this, about the, uh, the neurogenesis effects that DMT um, has been showing. Yeah, um, well, so neuro... Uh, uh, well, well, so neurogenesis is, you know, the production of, you know, new neurons from stem cells. You know, that's not getting, you know, quite as much interest as neuroplasticity, um, which is the uh, increasing complexity and number of connections among, uh, um, among neurons. Um, like in the prefrontal cortex, uh, you know, for example, in you know, certain, uh, you know, psychopathologies, um, you know, there's atrophy. Uh, of neurons, they're they're shrunk. You know, they're not especially um, interacting in a complicated manner as in their normal you know, fashion. You know, so what you know, seems to happen with any number of drugs, uh, but especially the psychedelics, is they increase neuroplasticity. You know, so there are a larger number um, of synapses. You know, which is you know nerve to nerve con uh, you know, connections. Um, and you, uh, their functional connections as well. So, you know, uh, there's interest in even developing, you know, compounds which are neuroplastic, which are not, you know, psychedelic themselves. And they're, you know, working with the scaffolding of, uh, you know, psychedelic uh, you know, compounds. And then um, by, uh, you know, medicinal you know, chemistry, you know, fiddling, you can remove the psychedelic effects, but, um, you know, not the neuroplastic ones. You know, so um, it you know, could be the neuroplasticity uh, is is you know, mediating the placebo response. 
the subjective effects do too, I think. Uh, so it, you know, maybe the placebo response you know, does not require a subjective experience, but it's enhanced you know, by a subjective experience. Like, you, you know, for example, the SSRIs uh, stimulate your neuroplasticity. Um, and they're especially you know, helpful in combination with you know, psychotherapy. Uh, you know, so if you have you know, new connections being formed, you want to steer those new connections in a you know, positive way. Uh, you know, same way with you know, psychedelics. They stimulate your neuroplasticity, but you know, to a greater extent. You can you know, maybe develop these non-psychedelic you know, you know, compounds, which begin with you know, the psychedelic compounds themselves. Uh, and they may turn out to be you know, super antidepressants, perhaps at least in part through activation of the placebo response. You know, but I think for more you know, difficult cases, for example, that you know don't respond to these you know super antidepressants or non psychedelic you know, psychedelics, you may need you know to use uh, you know psychoactive psychedelics, you know which would be for you know more difficult cases to increase your likelihood of success, but at the same time you're increasing you know the likelihood of adverse effects. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I I know this is not specifically your area of research, but. Do you have any thoughts on the current research that's being done on DMT, DMT in those who have experienced strokes? And I was assuming that was maybe, I think that's where I got neurogenesis from, because it seemed to me that they would must be trying to regrow areas of the brain. But can you talk a little bit about why you think that that might be an effective therapy? Or if you yeah. think so? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, most of this work began in Hungary, uh, and a lot of it is still going on there. Um you know, um, even though, you know, the serotonin type, you know, 2A receptor is the one that gets the most attention with respect, you know, to the classical, you know, psychedelics, you know, the sigma receptor uh, is also important, you know, the sigma 1 receptor. And, uh, you know, DMT um, attaches, you know, to the sigma 1 site as well. You know, so uh, the you know, sigma 1 site is um, involved in responses, you know, to hypoxia in neurons you know so if you if in vitro uh in the test tube if you starve neurons you know from oxygen or of oxygen you know they start dying you know but if you add your dmt you know they survive much longer you know so there you know, seems to be some you know neuroprotective effect of dmt on ischemic you know damage you know to neurons um, at least in the test tube you know, so this was expanded and extended, you know, to whole animals. Uh, and the groups in Hungary, you know, demonstrated if you treat an animal uh, with, you know, DMT after an experimental stroke, the stroke is much smaller. Uh, and in addition, the, you know, functional recovery is much, you know, quicker in, you know, the DMT animals. You know, so, you know, there's a group in, in Canada, um, it's called Algernon Pharmaceuticals, and uh, I'm consulting with, you know, with them. And, you know, they're developing a study. They're still working out the infusion parameters, but they're working with, you know, normal volunteers right now, you know, to do an extended non-psychedelic, uh, you know, dose um, of DMT, like, you know, six hours, you know, but it's, you know, sub-psychedelic, so, you know, people are just you know, reading a book or you know, taking it easy. And if you know they can work that out, you know, then they want to you know, move that into stroke patients. Uh, you know, to see if you can give you know, DMT in the ambulance and reduce uh, stroke size or you know can you uh, you know give it uh, in a rehab setting uh, in combination with you know, physical therapy and speed recovery. You know, these are like, you know, super speculative and, you know, not off the ground, you know, you know, don't try this at home kind of work, you know, but it is you know, being conceived of and implemented, you know, to some extent. That's incredible. And thank you for the mentioning the ambulance, because I was going to ask how long after the stroke did it, was it found to be effective? So it sounds like pretty immediately or in the right. near, near window. Right yeah. After. Yeah. Well, you know. I just can't, you know, like I'm embarrassed, but I, I, I can't remember if they pre-treated the animals with DMT and then stroked them or they stroked them and then gave them DMT, you know, but, but, but still it was close to the event. 
And well, that, that pre-treatment is an interesting concept because then that would bring up something like, uh, you know, you mentioned your friend, Jim Fadiman, like, is, is there a role for a low dose ongoing, you know, microdose of DMT that would be prophylactic? Is that something anybody has ever looked into? Well, you know, that's the whole, you know, thing about, you know, microdosing. I, I mean, God only knows what it's doing. Uh, like, you know, in the case of animals, you know, low doses of DMT, you know, non-behaviorally active doses of DMT stimulate your know, neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. And, you know, same with, you know, low doses of LSD, you know, low doses of ketamine, you know, low doses of you know, methamphetamine too, as well, M MDMA, there's a slew of compounds. Um, you know, so, um, at least in animals, you can demonstrate increased your know, neuroplasticity with your know, sub, uh, you know, psychoactive doses, you know, but, um, you know, they're just beginning to, you know, look at, you know, the science in humans about what, you know, microdosing um, is doing, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, suppose, well, I wouldn't want to be you know, quoted, you know, saying, yeah, if you microdose, you know, DMT, you're less likely to have a stroke, you know, that's completely untrue. Uh, you know, but but still, I'm sure pe that you know people are microdosing you know, psychedelics uh, with the belief that that could be the case. And and I have a question that I hope this does not uh, reveal any scientific ignorance on my part. But um, psilocybin, because I know you've you've uh, done investigations into psilocybin as well. But psilocin is the actual you know long scientific name contains DMT. It's like four or something DMT, correct? And does that behave in similar ways to the regular NNDMT that we're usually discussing? Um, well, you know, psilocybin is what's called I'm um, a pro drug. I mean, it has to be, um, um, you know, first metabolized um, into psilocin, uh, and you know, then psilocin is the you know behaviorally active compound. You know, psilocin is you know is you know four hydroxy DMT. Uh, you know, so it's just a hydroxy you know group added onto DMT. Um, you know, so you could say in you know, some ways that, you know, psilocin is orally active DMT, but that's not exactly true. It's, you know, psilocin, it isn't DMT, you know, but, but still it's, you know, mighty close. And, you know, if you want to, you know, talk about orally active DMT, that's ayahuasca. Yeah, absolutely. Um, something that I wanted to ask you about that you had in your book, the psychedelic handbook is you hypothesize, hypothesize that DMT may regulate our sense of reality. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, you know, there's a number of you know, potential roles of endogenous you know, DMT, you know, one we were, uh, you know, we're talking about, you know, kind of, you know, the placebo response, perhaps is working you know, behind the scenes to mediate that. You, you know, the other uh, you know, possible role is a bit more, you know, far out, you know, which is that the brain mind complex requires a certain window of, you know, DMT to perceive consensus reality. Um, that, you know, this is, you know, like it, you know, it could be the endo matrix, right? It's the, you know, compound which, you know, mediates our everyday, you know, sense of reality. And when, you know, concentrations increase, you know, for whatever reason, you know, then, uh, you know, things get psychedelic, schizophrenia, mystical experiences, you know, prophecy, dreams, things like that. Or when, you know, DMT, you know, levels, you know, drop, you know, things, you know, might get flat and boring and black and white, uh, you know, unexciting. You know, that's, you know, quite speculative, but, but still, I mean, it makes sense. If you have a, a compound in the brain who's, you know, hallmark when you give it is this is more real than real then it makes you think, well, you know, maybe the naturally occurring compound is you know, mediating that same, uh, you know, modality. That makes sense. And, and as we wrap up, I, I just want to summarize some of the things that, you know, if, because we, we, we covered a lot of concepts, um, but to go back, DMT is not, it is not created in the pineal gland. It is created in the, the visual cortex, correct? Well, you know, the jury is still out. Uh, you know, John Dean and, you know, Jimo Borjigan, they still have, and, and myself, we still have hopes, you know, for a pineal source of DMT. You, you know, the enzymes are there and the precursors are there. Uh, it may be it's just increased at certain times and, you know, not at others. You know, so there's more work that needs to be done. Uh, it's, you know, made in, you know, cortex itself, frontal cortex, motor cortex, but especially, you know, visual cortex. 
Got it. And and DMT in these other states don't necessarily produce these large increases in endogenous DMT, but you're saying that there may be at least a speculative role of endogenous DMT participating in naturally occurring spiritual experiences. Right. Well, you know, to, well, uh, you know, to the extent that those naturally occurring spiritual experiences resemble what happens when you ingest a big dose of DMT, you know, it might be useful to you know dig into the weeds a little bit on the issue of spiritual experience. Uh, you know, it's you know kind of a wastebasket you know term. I mean, in some ways, I think it's useful to you know differentiate between you know two types of a spiritual experience. You know, one is what is you know kind of you know cool nowadays, which is the unitive mystical state. Uh, it's the white light, content free. No, you know, there's no body. There's no uh, there's no time or space, uh, no personality, you know, no sense of self, e- uh, ego dissolution, those kinds of things. Uh, and there are, you know, questionnaires that score those kinds of experiences. You, you know, that's you know, what's emphasized, you know, mostly within both the scientific and, you know, the lay worlds right now. You know, but most people's experiences aren't that, aren't, aren't that way. You know, most you know, people's, you know, psychedelic experiences are what I call interactional relational in, in, in interactive relational. You, you know, they're full of content. The you know, personality is maintained. Well, you know, let me s- uh, step back you know, for a second. You know, like I had been studying and you know, practicing Zen Buddhism for a couple of decades before you know, beginning my studies. And I was expecting, you know, Kensho, you know, Satori, the, you know, Zen enlightened state, you know, which is a unitive mystical state. Um, and my volunteers were, you know, too, because most of them were practitioners, at least of some kind of Eastern religious you know, meditation. You know, but as opposed, but you know, but other than that one volunteer I mentioned early on, everybody else's experiences were interactive and relational. Uh, the state was, you know, full of content. You know, there were words and ideas and emotions exchanged between the volunteer and the you know content of the experience. Oftentimes, you know, there were beings in that state with whom volunteers interacted. Uh, the you know, sense of self was maintained even more strongly than usual. You know, so it was the complete opposite of both, you know, my expectations and the expectations of the volunteers. You know, so that, you know, got me thinking, oh, well, and as a sidebar, um, you know, if you're looking for naturally occurring compound, you, you know, that produces a mystical unit of state, I think the more appropriate or you know, suitable candidate would be 5-methoxy-DMT, you know, which is in the toad, and you can make it you know, synthetically as well. You, you know, that you know, more routinely you, you know, gives you uh, white light in the middle of the you know, sun, uh, burnt to a crisp you know, kind of experience. Um, and it's endogenous, but it hasn't been you know, looked at in the brain you know, nearly as you know, carefully as DMT. You, you know, but the DMT state is is not that way. It's you know full of content with which the person interacts. You know, so you know, uh, you know, generally that interactive relational state is you know kind of denigrated, you know, relative to the unitive mystical one. Um, and I'm not sure you know why that is. It you know, it you know, may be because you have to deal you know with the content of the interactive relational state. Um, you know, because, you know, there's ideas, there's words, there's notions, there's concepts. With the mystical unitive state, it's just a blank slate. And you come down and you can say whatever you want about it. Oh, this means that, or this means that, or this means that. You know, with a unit, you know, with an interactive relational experience, you're told certain things. Uh, and they're particular. They're particular to you. You know, so I think that is a little more, you know, troubling for people who want to say, oh, there's an underlying mystical unitive state underlying all, you know, religions or all spiritual experiences. That's just not true. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that I started, you know, digging into the Hebrew Bible's notion of the prophetic state, because it's, it's, you know, all interactive relational. There are, you know, there is not one mystical unit of state in all 22 books, you know, so I was keen on looking for, you know, uh, you know, for a different model. Is is there a model of spirituality 
that is akin to the phenomenology or the you know, phenomena brought on by psychedelics, which has got um, a tradition, uh, you know, mechanism um, of action, uh, you know, tools to interact with it. And, you know, for you know, better um, or for worse, as a Jewish person, I returned, you know, to my Jewish roots at a certain point, started reading the Hebrew Bible and said, you know, it's like if you compare the phenomenology of the DMT state and the prophetic state, just look at chapter one of Ezekiel. It's completely psychedelic. There's, you know, chariots and angels with wings and eyes on their wings and flying through space and, uh, you know, firmament and lightning is just completely psychedelic. Uh, you know, so you could speculate, you know, that the imagery anyway, uh, in the prophetic state, which is a spiritual experience, it's the, the foundation of the Bible, which is the foundation of Western civilization, uh, is perhaps, you know, mediated by elevated levels of DMT. That is very interesting. I did not know that. Very, very cool. Um, and you, you bring me to one last question, because as you're telling me all these things about, you know, what people have seen in their journeys, there was this interactive sense with beings and all of that. And then you also mentioned that it didn't generally bring things to you that you didn't already bring with you, at least in your subconscious somewhere. Um, you know, we had uh, Professor Matt Johnson on talking about his research into DMT entities, but Essentially, what you're saying, that if I'm understanding you right, is that what people are seeing in these journeys, you know, if they're like, it's not that somehow a machine elf appears to everybody. It's that at some point in time, either sub subconsciously or consciously, they have heard that DMT leads you to machine elves, and then that seems to be why there's a prevalence of them. Or is is that what I'm gleaning from? You know, because so many people write in and ask, even though we try to keep it very scientific, they ask the one question that I don't know that anybody's figured out. But like, why do you see what you see in these? DMT journeys and why do so many people tend to see kind of similar things? Uh, well, I think because, you know, DMT, you know, works on the brain, you know, similarly in, in, you know, people, uh, and it stimulates, uh, certain, you know, centers, emotional, visual, cognitive, you know, somatic, you know, those are, you know, general effects, you know, the specific effects, you know, specific to the person, um, you know, has to do with the building blocks, the raw material that, you know, that they have for perceiving things which were you know, previously invisible. Um, you know, the whole issue of, you know, do they, you know, like, you know, do the beings or is the information that they are seeming to transmit, you know, is it from Alpha, you know, Centauri, or, or is it just your brain on drugs? I think uh, that that's impossible to say. What you can I you know, say though, with some certainty, is is that you, you know what is being transmitted to you, what's being conveyed to you, was previously invisible, and you know the imagery and the feelings and whatnot, which the state presents to you, is dependent on what you have going on in your brain. Uh, if you've never seen a car, for example, well, you know, like ever in your life, you're not going to visualize a car on DMT. You know, but you may you know, visualize uh, you know, something else which conveys the same information, um, which which you may mean, or which which you may be something along the lines of uh, you know transportation, going from point A to point B, uh, you know speed, you know power, uh, those kinds of things. You, you know, so you can only perceive what you already have in your toolkit. Uh, you know, that's available to um, allow you to, you know, to apprehend, to, to comprehend, you know, what information is being, you know, displayed uh, in your mind. That makes sense. And Dr. Strassman, thank you for clarifying that and so many other concepts that I have waited 140 plus episodes to hear explained. Um, please let the listeners know if there's anything you're working on currently or where they could find out more about your previous works. Well, well, so one point I would like to make, you know, when we were talking about the Bible and the prophets, um, you know, there isn't any, uh, you know, need, <clears throat> you know, to propose that people in the Bible took drugs. There's, you know, zero evidence other than, you know, wine and strong wine. Uh, you know, there's, you know, theories about the manna being an ergot or, you know, cannabis in the incense, you know, you know things like that. But, you um, you know, you could stop, you know, looking under every, you know, rock uh, for a, you know, psychedelic, you know, compound. If you keep in mind that the brain 
makes DMT. Uh, and, you know, why is the brain making DMT in these individuals? You know, so that comes you know, down to my you know, theory comparing, you know, neurotheology, uh, you know, which is, you know, the brain on drugs. Uh, it's a reflex uh, responding to certain stimuli like prayer, uh, um, your meditation, you know, which stimulates on um, a brain reflex, which, you know, may produce DMT. And, you know, that occurs because it's evolutionarily advantageous. You might be more altruistic, you might be more creative. Um, you know, that's what you would call a bottom-up model. Uh, and in my, you know, in my 2014 book on, you know, DMT and the prophetic experience, I proposed a, you know, top-down model, which is more theological, uh, you know, and I, you know, coined the term, you know, theoneurology. You know, so that uh, suggests, you know, that, you know, for humans to be communicated with you know, by the divine, you know, the divine stimulates the production of, you know, DMT uh, in your mind, or in your brain, which, you know, produces you know, certain images. And, you know, those images are determined, you know, by, you know, the source that, you know, raises the endogenous levels of DMT. Uh, you know, so you would be, it, it would be on incumbent upon you as a you know, prophet, for example, uh, you know, to be able to extract information from the images which are, you know, divinely stimulated by means of endogenous, uh, you know, DMT elevation. You, you know, that's a mouthful. And uh, it, like, I spent, you know, 300 pages unpacking that idea, but uh, still, you know, that's it in a nutshell. Um, yeah, you know, so if you know, people want to be in contact, I've got a website, rickstrassman.com. You know, my email is on there. I, I answer, you know, pretty much, you know, 99.99% of emails. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, the best way to reach me. That's very kind of you and a very generous offer. Um, Dr. Strassman, thank you for decades of work and for helping restart this, this the psychedelic research world. Um we all owe you a debt of gratitude. Truly appreciate it. And I really appreciate your spending time here today with us. Well, thanks, Lynn. It was fun. Thanks so much. For everybody else out there, until next time. Thanks so much for listening to the Psychedelic Medicine Podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please leave a rating or review as it helps others find the show. And if you'd like to learn more, you can find the show notes at plantmedicine.org forward slash podcast. And there's information for clinicians at psychedelicmedicineassociation.org. Our incredible music was by the one and only Porangi. We'll see you next time.